Hello, CSW members and anyone who may be joining us today for an awesome webinar. I am so thrilled to be here today. I am in Ottawa. It is very sunny and quite warm, so it's a lovely day to be in here and to be with all of you. I hope wherever you are, wherever you're at, that you're enjoying your day as well. Uh, before we get started, as everyone knows, I'm Alexandra Zanis. I'm the Social Policy and Communications Coordinator here at the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Any questions you may have related to either social policy and or communications, I'm here. Please feel free to use your question and answer box to type those in. Uh, you can also always connect with us, the CSW, uh, through email and or by phone uh, or on Twitter and Facebook as well. I always forget those two little social media pieces, but please feel free to connect with us on those platforms as well. A uh, couple little housekeeping notes before I pass it on to our webinar presenter today. If you're looking to get that certificate of attendance for attending, you need to attend about 40 minutes of this presentation and then click the little yellow widget on the bottom of your screen. Just so you know, you can log in at any time. After about 24 hours, this uh, webinar converts to on demand. Once it does that, you can log on any time to access that certificate of attendance or rewatch it or share with your friends uh, and or colleagues. So that is the certificate of attendance. Uh, any questions you have, you can use the question and answer box either for questions related to the content, questions for uh, our presenter, or questions for me. And I will be making sure to formulate all of the questions into a more formal Q&A for the end uh, where we can really dive in and have some, some deeper discussions around this topic today. So like I said, please feel free to engage with us at any time. I would love to hear from you and hear about what kind of work and what you're doing. Uh, our presentation today is titled Grief in the Time of COVID-19 and Lessons for Social Work. We are joined by an absolutely incredible webinar presenter today, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to work with Dr. Susan Kettle. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to have you. Um, take it away. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, hello everyone, um, my name is Michelle. I'm uh, in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo and want to recognize that uh, it's on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and neutral peoples. And uh, I am uh, grateful to be able to do this and to share some of those ideas about uh, grief in this uh, time uh, that we are in and to think with you about uh, some of the things that we can do in social work. Um, so just very quickly today I want to go over uh, just do an overview of grief literacy, tell you what I'm talking about in terms of grief, talk a little bit about grief and COVID-19, go over some vignettes um, and uh, talk a little bit about tattoos just because I can and they're about, and they're about grief as well and then uh, get more into uh, some of the implications for social work which is also where I'm hoping where we can get more into the uh, questions and uh, the give and take. So grief literacy um, is uh, a an idea that I've been working on with this awesome group of international folks. Uh, Lauren Breen is in Australia. Daisuke Kawashima is in Japan. Karima Joy is in Canada. Myself, David Roth is in Germany. And Amy Chow is in Hong Kong. And Mary Ellen McDonald is in uh, Montreal. Um, and uh, so grief literacy grows out of this really awesome uh, idea around public health and palliative care. Um, and this has to do with the Compassionate Communities Movement, which you might have heard of. Some communities have signed on as Compassionate Communities in Canada. Um, the actual charter um, is called the Ottawa Charter because it was actually signed. It's an international charter about Compassionate Communities, but it was signed in Ottawa a number of years ago. Um, and so the public health palliative care movement is the background for our thinking about um, um, about um, grief literacy, um, and as part of grief, part of the public health and palliative care um, movement, there's been uh, a, a 
surge in um, deaf literacy and you know there's, there's deaf cafes and there's a deaf positive movement and there's much more dialogue um, about uh, about death and about death and dying and about uh, advanced care directives and here in Canada of course um, you know we have um, a lot more um, discussion about assisted death and, and dying since uh, that became legal so there's been a real movement um, to 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 talk more and to understand more about death and dying um, However, um, there's a bit of a gap because although um, the, the uh, public health palliative care movement and all of the death literacy says it's about grief, it actually often grief is on the back burner. It's, it's not very understood. And even as we're increasing um, our knowledge about death and dying, we're not necessarily increasing our um, our understanding and literacy around grief. So we recognized this gap um, and uh, wanted to kind of fill it in. Um, the other part of the background um, is the uh, public health model of bereavement care. Uh, this is a model in um, Australia where um, Samar Ayun and Lauren Green and others uh, kind of um, theorized that um, the uh, that there would be those only uh, only ten percent of folks who were bereaved um, would be at high risk of of complicated grief. So they were looking at the the, the proportions of people um, who are at risk for um, complicated grief. Um, and so at low risk, moderate risk, and high risk with the, you know, the idea being that only 10% um, and would be at high risk of complicated grief um, and therefore absolutely need specialized um, services and specialized bereavement care with professionals. Um, and that only 30% would be at moderate, moderate risk, so might need some peer support, some, um, some, um, you know, some additional supports, but um, they were at moderate risk. And whereas low risk, uh, the majority of individuals, 60%, um, would deal with uh, grief and um, by being in their communities, seeking out their families, their friends, their neighbors, their, um, their faith communities. Um, and what's important to think about is that 100% of these people, regardless of their level of risk, benefit from a community's greater ability to support anybody who's grieving. So um, everybody benefits, 100% of people benefit from a, a higher community capacity to, uh, to support people. Um, so uh, it's, it's hard to see and you'll see it, you'll be able to see it on the slides afterwards, but um, on this model, the red numbers are actually um, numbers for research. So the black numbers, the 10%, the 30%, 60% are what they theorized the model would look like. And then they tested it with a group of people in um, one of the provinces of Australia and found that, um, in fact, it was 6.4% 6, 6 were at high risk and 58.4% were at low risk. So they, their numbers were pretty accurate. So that's part of the the background for our thinking as well um, about um, about grief literacy, and so uh, here's a photo of the uh, group of us that I named uh, earlier. We were um, gathering at the um, international work group on death, dying, and, and bereavement, and called ourselves the Public Health Work Group, and spent a week uh, talking with one another um, and. Um, and then uh, worked on um, this uh, article that's been published in Death Studies that is in the resources. So you can um, have a look at it if you're um, interested in, in uh, reading more. But we called it a call to action for compassionate communities because we believe that um, everybody can benefit if we have greater grief literacy. So that's... Um, that's, that's the background. So what is grief literacy? Um, and what we de defined it as is an individual's capacity 
to access, process, and use knowledge regarding the experience of loss. And that it's a multi-dimensional capacity um, in that it has knowledge and skills and values, and the, those dimensions um, connect and integrate um, in, by the interdependence of individuals within social cultural context. So we're trying to you know, embed the individual, the communities, individual capacities, and interdependence um, and culture and all of those aspects. So that's how we uh, define brief literacy. We first of all spent a lot of time looking for a definition of brief literacy and in the little, the few times that we found it mentioned, it wasn't actually defined. Um, and deaf literacy would often say it included grief literacy, but it didn't actually talk about um, grief very much. And so this is how we, uh, this is how we then defined it. Um, and um, so the, uh, then we went through thinking about it in terms of uh, various aspects. Um, and we started to think about it in terms of, we wanted grief literacy to encompass all kinds of types of loss, all kinds of people who um, might be experiencing the loss. Um, the uh, loss, if the uh, when if when someone dies, that uh, you know whoever that person was um, uh, could vary by age and, and relationship to the person. Um, also, uh, that did, grief does not just only occur in terms of people and um, and death. It can be um, it can be pets that die. It can be jobs that are lost, um, identities that are lost, divorces that happen. So, um, and also when uh, the death or loss occurred, and you know, which is you know now when we think about the pandemic, this is going to kind of be the one of the key things in terms of you know deaths and grief that happen in the pandemic. The when is going to be really important. Where um, where the loss occurred, uh, you know, sometimes we live far away from people or we live far away from people that we're supporting, um, those kinds of, uh, or, you know, those kinds of situations. So where is really important at, as well as how. If when a person dies, sometimes they die of natural causes, sometimes they, they die tragically, sometimes they're murdered, um, and um, so, the how of the person died is really important. And so we, we started to think about it in terms of all of those pieces, and we started to think about um, what it would look like. And um, what we decided to do was think about if we were living in a grief, li grief, grief literate society, what that would look like. And so what we started to do is to imagine vignettes. And we would... And the question we asked ourselves is, how would we know if we were grief literate? And so what I'm going to give you now is a few uh, vignettes. There are more in the article. Um, and, and then later on, I'll um, do a few in terms of COVID that are sort of in draft form, if I can say. Um, so the first, um, the first vignette was, is about Hassan. Hassan was... Uh, forced to leave his dog while escaping from Syria during the Civil War. Um, and uh, five years later, now living in Sydney, he meets Ida walking her dog. Ida notes Hassan's interest in her dog and invites him to tell his story. Ida recognizes Hassan's grief, invites him to walk the dog with her and teach her more about Syria. So we're trying, you know, in this to address... Um, loss in terms of loss of culture, loss of um, place, you know, moving, uh, uh, moving uh, across the world um, and uh, presumably losses, um, you know, in, in Syria and his country of origin because of the civil war. Um, so, you know, th this is a vignette where we thought, okay, this is, this is, if, if life were always like this, we would be living in a grief literate society. This is an example of it. And we continued on uh, with another one. Uh, Phyllis hires Bill, an indigenous speaker, to address her class by telling his people's story, focusing on resilience, intergenerational grief, and trauma. 
The students appreciate hearing the personal side of what is already covered in their assigned textbook. So again, here we're, uh, we're um, trying to incorporate um, you know, intergenerational grief, intergenerational trauma, um, um, you know, a focus on resilience. Um, you know, we're modeling, um, um, you know, the respect of, of, of hiring people to tell their stories, not just inviting them to tell their stories uh, for free. Um, and we're also modeling uh, Indigenous history uh, being part of school curriculums, which, as we know in Canada, isn't universally true. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways that we thought, okay, this is an example. This is one example of how we're grief literate. Another is Carlos. Uh, Carlos is 12 years old. With the anniversary of his twin brother's death approaching, his football teammates are more attentive to Carlos. They notice that despite the heat, Carlos will only wear long sleeve jer jerseys. Worried that Carlos might be self harming, the teammates approach the coach for advice. So again, we have kids, um, we have children who are sensitive, they are, um, they are knowledgeable about um, you know, risk situations, they're knowledgeable about who uh, they should go to, um, they are knowledgeable about how um, you know, their, their teammates, um, teammate is coming up to an anniversary and how important the anniversaries of deaths are. So you know, there's there, this is a this is another example of how we're um, we would know if we were living in a grief literate society. Um, so one more example that I'm going to uh, share, and as I said, there are more in the article. So if you want to go uh, read more, uh, you're welcome to. Um, the last one uh, is Jen and Britta. Jen and Britta have just met at a barbecue. Jen asks Britta about her work. And Britta says she is a counselor who works with people bereaved by suicide. Britta is confident that disclosing her work will be met with an affirming response from Jen. Jen responds, oh, I've never done that. Tell me more. Um, this one, as social workers and, um, and you know, in, in talking to other people who, who do grief work and things like that, th this, this vignette is often met with laughter. Um, uh, because we know that um, this often does not happen. And so, you know, this is a, if, if, if we were living in a society like this, um, we would be far more grief literate. Um, so the, this is an example about um, grief, how the grief literacy would benefit um, people who work in the area as well. Um, so... Uh, so that's the last vignette uh, uh, from the article that I'll share with you. And I just thought um, that we should uh, talk about grief. So what, uh, what, what it is that I'm talking about, I thought I should um, define a few things and um, um, be specific about a few terms that I'm using, but also not make any assumptions that um, everyone is uh, familiar with uh, all of the concepts, um, and uh, because I know, uh, working in social work education, um, that there's not a lot of education in social work about grief. I myself had zero, and um, I bring it up in every classroom that I can. But there are um, there are no. Um, there are no social work education programs in Canada that I'm aware of that include mandatory education. It's not in our accreditation standards. Um, if we were in an audience, I'd have to ask for a show of hands about how many of you had any education about grief in your um, in your social work training. But um, maybe we'll get to that um, in the in the comments. But anyway, I thought we should spend some time talking about grief. Plus, I love to talk about grief, so I never miss that opportunity. So what am I talking about? Um, lots and lots and lots of people have heard of the five stages of grief. The five stages of grief have entered our society, our literature, our popular literature, our television, our the, uh, notions of, um, of what grief is, um, and it's everywhere. Um, the five stages originally were 
about people who were dying. They were uh, never meant to be about grief, and they got sort of adopted into being about grief um, by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, was a scholar in thanatology, the study of death and dying, and she uh, did us all an enormous favor uh, in North America, at least, in that she really began uh, to open up the conversation about death and dying. Um, however, in my opinion, her stages have done us a great disservice. Um, and um, because they've, and, and from my understanding, she never thought that they should be about grief and that they should never be um, and regarded as linear and that, that they should never be regarded as absolutely you need to do this and then this. Um, and that they, that you do all of them. Um, nonetheless, they have en entered our sort of cultural uh, zeitgeist. So, I um, my um, personal refrain is always no more five stages of grief. I would like to see us um, to to end that conversation. I would like to see us challenge it wherever we can. Um, and very recently, um, David Kessler, who actually co-wrote a book with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, has written a book about the sixth stage of grief, which is about finding meaning, finding and making meaning. And I 100% agree with him that making meaning and finding meaning in grief is hugely important. I still... Um, really struggle with the idea of, of it being staged. And, and part of my struggle with that is talking to colleagues and clinicians who, um, who talk about clients and people who think that they're doing grief wrong because they haven't experienced one of the five stages. Um, and so that's why I'd really like to banish the five stages um, and talk of the five stages. David Kessler describes them as signposts but frankly, I think if they're signposts in grief, they're potentially leading us down the wrong path because not everyone, uh, not everyone experiences every one of those those um, aspects. And and now he's saying that there's actually six, not not five. So um, I would like us just not to be talking about stages at all. So I'd love to hear your comments. Um, I'd love to hear some discussion about that. Um, and um, I have to say, I am reading um, this, the David Kessler's book about the sixth stage. I'm not all the way through it, but I'm giving him a chance. But so far, I still don't want stages. So what do I want? What do I think about grief? What do, what do I, um, what, how do I understand it? So um, the, there's a couple of models of uh of grief, and, and I just wanted to say as a sidebar, I personally use uh, grief and uh, bereavement um, interchangeably. They technically are um, different terms, um, and the English language has multiple terms, but there are other languages like French that only have one term. So um, I, you know, I just use them interchangeably because people, when they're experiencing a loss, are you know, they're not differentiating between um, de their grief and their bereavement experience and things like that. So I just use them interchangeably. Um, this, uh, this slide is um, the two-track model of, of um, grief and, and bereavement. Uh, and so basically it's, um, there's a couple of things that I particularly like about it. Um, the, the main thing is at the bottom, it says time, days, weeks, months, years. One of the myths of grief is that there's some kind of time frame and that people need to get over it. Um, and grief goes on and on and on. And um, depending on the kind of grief um, that you're experiencing, it it can last a lifetime and and it might change over time um, and shift over time but that um it 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 doesn't uh, one does not recover from grief 
brief changes and to leave changes us. So this model um, acknowledges that it, that grief has an impact on us in a biopsychosocial sense, but also in a relational sense, and that um, that those interact with one another. But um, you know, grief definitely um, it, you know has physical consequences for people, um, and um, you know, there, there, and there's just so many ways that it affects us um, biologically, psychologically, and socially. Um, and also the ways that it affects um, our relationships. Um, the uh, other uh, model of grief that I like, I refer to um, as the oscillation model because the, the middle um, has this oscillation between the two, um, the, the two orientations. So one orientation is towards restoration, not recovery, but restoration. Um, and one uh, orientation is towards the loss. So it's essentially, uh, you know, it's the it's the facing the loss and the grief, and then, you know, facing um, facing back to life with, uh, you know, without the loss. Or what we might talk about is denial of the loss, but I mean denial in a in a positive sense. Um, and. What, what people are doing is binging, binging, oscillating, binging back and forth between, between those two. So you can see there's nothing linear about this experience um, and, um, and people go back and forth. So it's not going from one to the other. It might be, you know, going, just starting to turn away from restoration and then turning, it back, turning back again and turning away from loss and then turning back again. Or it might be going from restoration to loss. It's all over the place. In the resource list is a second uh, version of this that's even more complicated, but it doesn't make for a very good slide. This is actually, this is one of my, um, with my favorite models of grief because um, it recognizes uh, the complexity um, of the experience and how we turn back and forth and we oscillate from, um, you know, being oriented towards the loss and being oriented to getting back to real life. And I'm making air quotes around that. Um, and so this image is just to, uh, to say that grief is complicated. And I want to be really clear when I say complicated, grief is always, always, always complicated, but it is not necessarily complicated grief. Complicated grief and prolonged grief are becoming recognize for better or for worse as a disorder. Um, and um, I keep trying to, to trouble the use of the word complicated because grief is always complicated. It's complex, it is not straightforward, hence my dislike of stages as well because that seems some, some you know, to indicate some kind of linear path, pathway that's, uh, that's just not accurate and that this image with that kind of tangled web uh, um, is is much more accurate of, of grief. Um, and the most important aspect of uh, grief theory, in my opinion, is the, um, is the notion of continuing bonds. So there used to be um, a, a thought that grief entailed detaching from the person who died um, or detaching from the identity if it, you know if it was a non-death related loss. Um, but what we what we understand now is that grief is about um, a different kind of relationship, forging a different kind of relationship um, with with the person. Um, so this is, this image is someone saying goodnight to a photograph. Um, and you know, with the, the the indication that yes, this is normal, and this notion that um, uh, can, that we have that the bond doesn't end; it changes when someone dies. So, uh, I in the grief work or the grief research that I've done, lots and lots of people I've talked to have um, talked about talking to photographs um, or traveling with photographs. So this uh, representation, there's no model per se of continuing bonds, but the, the, this represents that idea. Um, so grief, in summary, this 
this uh, quote from uh, Rabbi Grohlman sums it up really nicely. Grief is not a disorder, it is not a disease, and it is not a sign of weakness. It is an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. And grief is the price that you pay for love. And the only cure for grief is to grieve. The only way to get through it is through it. Um, and so I, I included this because this is also, in my opinion, a representation of continuing bonds. Um, this is a portrait of, a, of children that was painted after the child who was in the carriage died. So this portrait is also continuing bonds, in my opinion, it, indicative of continuing bonds. This portrait is enshrining the position of this child in the family. Um, you know, in, in a day when photographs and Instagram and Facebook didn't happen, but this, you know, this portrait is a way of um, ensuring that that child um, is, um, you know, has a continued place um, in the family. Um, and uh, so that's an example of that. Um, it's just an, another example of continuing bonds. And this too is an example of a continuing bond. So one of the um, research projects that um, I've been involved in um, was about memorial tattoos. And the tattoos are another way of um, expressing the bond to the person that's died. So this is actually a fingerprint. Um, it's a woman whose husband died and she had his uh, fingerprints um, transformed into a heart on her wrist um, in part to have her husband's, uh, you know, um, her children's father present with her um, uh, forever. So um, one of her children actually remarked to her that you have daddy's heart. Um, so it's a it's a continuing bond. It's just one example. I have um, I have numerous examples, and um, just to share one more, uh, it, this uh, is a leaf um, on the back of a um, this person's calf, and in the leaf, it's really hard to see, but is the word is the Dutch word for strength, and this this tattoo honors this uh, person's brother. Uh, who died in an accident, and the the family, particularly the mother, set, sort of uses this word as a had always used this word um, as sort of a, a a blessing, as you know, as they parted from one another to you know sort of be strong, um, and uh, so the tattoo both honors the brother who died, but also honors the parents and their language and their tradition um, of using this word though the parents are still alive. So it's also, um, it's an, it's also an example of continuing bond. So I share those with you because um, I always like to talk about tattoos. Um, so grief and COVID, there's so much, there's so much right now. There's so much grief uh, and there is an increased dialogue about grief. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, this virus is um, causing us lots of grief. And I think that there are people recognizing um, grief in a new way, but that there's so many things to be grieving right now. They're grieving the ability, you know, to hug our friends, grieving the ability to move around easily, grieving the ability um, to to travel. Many of us are grieving our jobs because so many of us have lost our jobs, not to mention the grief of people dying. So there are so many ways that we are grieving in this time. Um, so part of, and, and the, the, there's a link to this in the resources as well, um, the, that international group that I work with, we worked on this um, sort of extension of the grief literacy idea in the, in the time of COVID. Um, it's an, an article on Medium that you're you know, welcome to read. And um, I have drafted just a few vignettes that I'd love that are really in draft form that I, you know, 
love to have uh, feedback on and would invite you to, um, to, to think about uh, these and other ways of uh, having vignettes that, can, that, are about, um, that are about grief in the time of COVID. So how would we know if we're grief literate in the time of COVID? Uh, the, so the vignette that I've drafted is Marco had just turned 18 and officially become an adult. He was experiencing complica complications of an injury he had sustained a few months earlier and his family physician advised him that he needed to be seen in the emergency department. His mother, accompanied to the hospital, was not allowed to stay with him due to the pandemic restrictions. She was very upset by this and she sought support from a neighbor who kept her company while waiting for news. So, no, you know, nobody's, um, it's, it, this vignette is, um, needs paring down, but, you know, is trying to get at that, that. And you've probably all heard these stories of people having to drop off their recently adult children to go, you know, into hospital situations alone that are not necessarily COVID related, but the restrictions are related to the pandemic. Uh, another one that's, uh, that I uh, drafted was B. Uh, B and the whole family had taken great precautions to prevent the possible spread of the virus. Despite their best intentions and interventions, B became ill. Uh, B was admitted to the ICU and died there. Family and friends had not been able to visit because of the pandemic restrictions, although they had chatted by telephone and video as much as possible. The family felt at peace with B's death in this unexpected time. The funeral services were held virtually and enormous support was expressed, even though the people could not gather in person. This one is, no, I don't know if you've noticed, but the bus on the side says Utopia. Their de destination is Utopia. This one is particularly utopian because um, this is actually kind of encapsulates the biggest concern in the in this time of pandemic is that people are being cut off from people who are dying, be they in long-term care where there's been so, so many deaths, um, be they in hospital, um, and not being able to be there may uh, put people um, at risk of um, much more complicated grief. Um, and the fact that they, they, you know, they can't gather, they can't have that uh, as easily, they can't have, you know, large gatherings of funerals and, and um, they can't as easily access the support, you can't necessarily get hugs from friends. Um, you know, again, is also um, one of the ways that this um, this may be very complicated. Uh, so one more, one final example, Amika was dying in hospital. She had been living with cancer for months and was supported by her partner and family. She had been admitted before the pandemic began and had constantly had a friend or family member by her side throughout. Now Amika was no longer allowed visitors. In understanding how difficult this was for her family, they were included in team meetings via video chat. In addition, as Amigo could no longer manage it herself, staff would spend several minutes per day at scheduled times to allow her to video chat with family or friends. So a, a little bit of this is happening. And, and again, this is you know that utopian view, but there are people who are dying in hospital who are not dying of COVID, but the restrictions are uh, preventing um, others from from being there in the way that they that they normally could. So that's what this one's trying to get at. Um, so what can we do as social workers? I mean, I think the number one thing is that uh, we need to be talking about this. We need to be uh, we need to be educating ourselves and others. One of the one of the one of the things about grief literacy that we talk about in the article is. The first place to start in grief literacy is recognizing our own grief. So we need to recognize our own grief and in order to help others recognize it. And in this time of COVID, that is hugely important because there is just so much grief. Um, so, you know, talking, educating, connecting, I think those are always, those are always really important. Um, one of the things that, um, I think is really important as well is knowing um, that when someone has died, it's really important that we use the name of that person, that we engage others in conversation, you know, be it, um, be it virtually, be it in person when we can, when we can do that. Um, but that 
um, we need to be using uh, the names of people who died um, because the, we have this belief that um, we're going to hurt someone's feelings by bringing up the name of the person who died, but the, but the actual fact is um, the, that people are waiting for permission to talk about that person. They want, and they want to talk about the person, and sometimes they don't want to talk about that person, but they might then just say that they don't want to talk about that person, but they'll know it's okay to do it. So, um, and, and again, there's a YouTube video, how to, how, to, how to friend a grieving friend, how to help a grieving friend. There's a typo there, sorry about that. Um, and uh, it's a great video that's just a, not about fixing. It's, a, you know, it's a little five minute video with a rabbit and a bear. It's applicable to everyone. Um, it's, it's super helpful. Um, so as social workers, we also need to ask questions. We need to ask people about grief. We need to ask them about their tattoos. We need to ask them the stories behind them. And that will also get at grief because that is also about connections um, and relationships. And um, so we, you know, we need, as social workers, we need to be the, the ones going there. Uh, one other thing we can do is get involved. There's a current call uh, to form a National Grief Alliance. Uh, it's, it is a request that is um, in the Prime Minister's office with the Minister of Health. Um, there are countries around the world that have National Grief Alliances. This is the time to do it. Um, and there's, uh, in the resource list, there's a link to sign up as individuals um, and um, uh, you know, I'm really pleased that the Canadian Association of Social Work Board has agreed to sign on. There's a lot of um, associations that have agreed to sign on, and now is the time. The hashtag is make grief a priority, and now is the time to make grief a priority. It's all, in my opinion, it's always been a time, but now in this pandemic, it is uh, super important. So I would love to hear from folks, questions, suggestions for vignettes, uh, feedback on what's there, um, anything I missed, anybody want to defend the five stages for to me, I would love to hear from folks. It's funny, actually, to hear how many people came back and said that they completely agreed with your analysis of <laughs> dumping the five stages. <laughs> Everyone came back. Yeah. 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 It's just it's not doing anyone a it's not doing anyone a service anymore. And when I see it in when I see it in the literature, in, uh, like like not academic literature, when I see it in 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 novels, like it just I think yeah. it's it's like entered our social fabric in a way mm -hmm. that's really not helpful. And so people feel guilty if they haven't felt one of those stages or people feel like they're just not doing right. Grief, grief is so um, disorienting anyway. And if we have this feeling, these, even if we call them signposts, but that we haven't seen all the signposts that somehow we're doing something wrong. Yeah, and that was the number one comment actually coming in during the Q&A section um, was in terms of the stages of grief, the overwhelming uh, responses where people were feeling like when, when you put that into the situation, they were doing it incorrectly. As if, right. you know, like <laughs> in yeah. terms of the stages. like So yeah, yeah that's yeah. an added factor of am I doing it right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a ton of questions. Are you ready to go into the Q&A section? I am. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to first off by say, if, if you joined late, please make sure that you uh, check out all the widgets in the bottom. We're going to go into the Q&A section now. There is a lot of you on the webinar, so please uh, type your questions now. We're going to try and get through all of them, but we have also included um, our emails as well. So if you want to get in touch with us by that, you can do that as well. Um, so one thing I wanted to know before I get into the actual formal Q&A section is you had asked how many people um, had any formal grief training. And so we had about 10 people come back yes. that said that they had formal grief training and there's about 400 people on the That's webinar. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Good to, so, good to know, so we, a, a small minority. <laughs> yeah. So 10 of you, like, thank you for being here and continuing your education and for all the rest Absolutely. of us, <laughs> like me, 
who had no training at all. Um, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Now I'm going to go back into this. One of the big questions, actually, that kind of came up a couple times is when an individual is actually seeking support to express their grief, um, yeah. can you speak a little bit as to how social workers can be a little bit more open? Been. And I mean, the, we're talking softer personality, maybe, um, you know, how, how do we be approachable when people talk about grief? What are some key points? Right. Uh, for me, the number one thing starts with asking the person who's seeking my help to talk about the person mm -hmm. and, and inviting that storytelling in a, in a, in a really open way so that Sometimes that storytelling is going to involve, you know, how that person died, or that storytelling is going to involve a whole disease trajectory, or, or the storytelling is going to be about who they were in life and how, what they had accomplished, or the story is going to be about. There's just so many ways, and so if I can, if I can open up the conversation by getting a person to talk to me about the, per the person who's died, um, then I can follow their lead so that they are, um, um, they are starting off with whatever, um, you know, whatever is problematic, if it's problematic. Um, and I think, um, you know, I've, just, I've, I've done so I've had so many conversations with people about um, uh, you know caregiving and bereavement that um, when I was doing the tattoo research, I was incredibly surprised that the um, the stories didn't always involve the way the person died. There were some interviews where after the interview, looking back, I realized I had no idea how the person had died um, because those interviews were about the tattoos. Those interviews were about the connections, the, the on, how, that, the, how the person with the tattoo was honoring the person who died or their, about their relationship. And sometimes that had to do with the way that the person died and sometimes it had nothing to do with it at all. Um, and so... Um, but because we would just sort of enter into it in that case about the tattoo, but it's sort of and then follow along with where the person was going with the story, um, then you know that's uh, the person would lead us to whatever needed to happen. Because sometimes it's you know sometimes it's not um, it's not about grief. Sometimes it's about you know. Um, you know, trauma, there's just so many stories about, you know, getting diagnoses dumped on people when people have a diagnosis of serious illness. And sometimes the, the, the sticking points or what people might need help with might not actually be about the grief. Um, it might actually be about some other part of the story. So that's the way I would start off um, and then try to follow the lead and sort of walk alongside the person. And, and just to add one more thing to that, the other thing I would encourage everybody to think about doing is um, to increase your ability to sit with silence. That sometimes we need to sit in silence, sometimes we need to literally like sit with people um, because, th because there's nothing to say. There, th there is no right thing to say in grief, um, and sometimes we just need to be there. You know, it's funny, I was going to wait until maybe we, we got offline, but I'll just say it this morning, I um, put on a, a background for this webinar, and I chose mountains uh, and a sunset. And the reason I chose that was because I've been grieving uh, my family back in uh, Calgary and yeah. in the mountains and my siblings and the people that I can't see. And I actually yeah. have a tattoo of the mountains that I put up. So this is weird. <laughs> It's a little, uh, <laughs> in other words, 
Yeah. In other words, uh, you're right. I think. <laughs> yeah. So I I definitely feel that, and I think I think that the more conversations and the more ability we are to be open to conversations and also open yeah. to listening. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, and um, and, on a, and, and uh, I mean I think and asking about uh, tattoos. Um, yeah. Because sometimes people don't have tattoos, but they have ideas for tattoos. That 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 actually that's also another. Um, it's another entry point into the story. And I and I just you know, again, just to be brief, but also don't be, make assumptions about who has tattoos. The oldest person who um, who I interviewed in our tattoo uh, research uh, got his first tattoo in his seventies, and he was in his eighties when I interviewed him. So, you know, it's not, it's not just young people who get tattoos. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I think that's an, and it's a really tangible thing too for, for members who are attending this to take away is, you know, we can, we had this conversation as well in our spirituality webinar was, you know, we're able to ask all these questions, but rarely we say, are you spiritual? Do you have any kind of faith background? Right. Uh, yeah. Potentially the same thing in terms of tattoos. Um, yeah in terms of asking. We can ask these yeah. questions. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, one of the questions we were talking about is wondering about validating clients' experiences and normalizing them. Is that a, is that a good thing to do? Is it, is it, or is that like something we should try and avoid? No, I mean, I think that's part of, I think that's part of any kind of literacy, right? Is that, is that we're, that we validate and, and it's part of that idea that grief is complicated and very, very, very individual. How I grieve, uh, you know, how, how I grieve my father is different from how my, my children are grieving their grandfather, how my partner's grieving, you know, his father-in-law and how my sibling is grieving his father, his father, who's the same father um yeah but we're all differently right and um so normalizing you know each person's experience and 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 especially right now normalizing that yeah we are feeling grief we are feeling grief and it's okay to feel grief like i just today um you know my the emails from the university are that you know we're having virtual graduation well i'm sure it, that there are people who are grieving not being able to walk across that stage. There are people who are grieving not being able to have their families cheer for them in those stands. And, and that's legitimate. And we should never, ever minimize that. Um, to quote David Kessler again, like there's a really, really good podcast. If you haven't heard it, there's um, Brene Brown interviewing David Kessler. And it's in the time of, the, it's like since the pandemic, and, um, and there's a lot of great moments in it. But one of the things he said is that people ask him what's the worst kind of grief. And he says, the worst kind of grief is the grief that you're experiencing right now. That we should never be comparing that one kind of grief is worse than another, or it's, mm -hmm. or it's, you know, oh, you know, you, 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 uh, you, you still get to graduate. You shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be grieving not being able to go to your graduation ceremony or wh whatever we might do. Um, that I think it's really important that we that we validate, that we not compare, that we not silence, that we not um, create hierarchies. We do that a lot with um, with child loss, the worst kind of grief. Well, there's no worst kind of grief. It's all, yeah. as somebody said to me just today in an in a research interview, grief sucks. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting too right now, especially this time, I feel like you had said even just we're grieving so much and honoring that we are grieving a multitude of different things that you know maybe on top of that is also death but we could be for me i'm i'm grieving the mountains i'm grieving a sense of home uh -huh. i'm grieving stability yeah yep yeah, absolutely i'm grieving not being able to hug my friends uh you know this yeah yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's really important. And it's really important, I think, to note that as well. Um, speaking, speaking of um, child grief, actually a little bit, but more towards how do you start to address feelings of, of regret and or guilt when people are grieving? Um, the, you know, the first thing that we need to understand is, you know, what it is, what it is that people are feeling, you know, to, I mean, my, my go-to question as a social worker is always tell me more about that. Um, mm. and tell me more about that and tell me more about that. Um, and you know, I mean, I think that's what we really need to, to unpack is what is, what is the guilt about, um, and, you know, then, you know, work with that. I mean, I think one of the, one of the, you know, in this time of, of COVID, one of the uh, worries is that people are going to feel guilty about possibly having transmitted, transmitted it to someone. Um, and, and that's, and that's so beyond our control. And yeah. yes, we feel that guilt. Um, and, um, and, you know, I might need to, to talk that through, but, uh, you know, I, I think we need to, we just, we need to hear more about it and unpack it and unravel it and follow it through and, 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 you know, see where that goes. Um, and, you know, um, sometimes guilt is there are, there are, you know, legitimate pieces that we might feel guilty about, but at some point, we also need to be able to forgive ourselves because sometimes we screw up. And so, you know, that, that, you know, the work might be that self forgiveness piece. Yeah. First of all, as social workers, we need to understand what it is that we're, what, what we're hearing and what, what, what the guilt is about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, so for a lot of a lot of some people came in late. Um, so I know that you had you briefly touched on this, but for a lot of social workers who are working in a, a multitude of different sectors. Um, so we have social workers on here who work in child protective. We have social workers on here who do medical. We have a lot of grief counselors actually on here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, why do you think it's very important for individuals in almost every facet of social work to have a deeper understanding of grief? What is it that is empowering to someone who maybe doesn't come in in uh, contact with grief a lot uh, mm -hmm. to have a, a solid understanding of, of grief uh, mm -hmm. in, in this discussion? Yeah, yeah. I think I mean uh, in I think in social work uh, we are going to encounter it. We um, you know, if it's not, uh, if it's, you know, because grief is not just about death, right? Grief is about loss. And so, you know, I think about child welfare and child welfare, there's just so many kinds of losses um, that are not necessarily death related, but sometimes they are. And, you know, losing a job, um, losing, an, losing an identity, losing, um, losing the opportunity to walk across the stage and graduate, losing, you know, the, all the all kinds of losses um, produce feelings. And, you know, it's it's really important that uh, that we acknowledge that and, and normalize that and, you know, have a better understanding of it um, so that, um, you know, we can better support one another. We can better support one another within our profession because we also feel grief. Um, and, and the reality is, is that, you know, like the old adage, the only thing you can't avoid is death and taxes. Well, there's some people who manage to avoid taxes, but nobody avoids death. And at, at some point, grief will happen to us. Death, you know, we will be touched by death. Um, and, um, so, you know, if it's not, um, even, you know, not a, the sector that we're working in, although when we're working in, you know, hospitals, then, you know, it, it is happening, even though there are hospitals and health centers who like to pretend that it doesn't happen, um, that, uh, you know, it, it, it will happen. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just something that, you know, we talk in social work about having tools in our toolbox, Mm -hmm. Understanding grief is a tool that we should all have in our social work toolbox. 
understanding and being able to sit with it. I think that that would have been a really great, uh, in, in my personal education, would have been a great conversation. A lot of what I'm hearing right now in terms of uh, the dialogue around uh, Black Lives Matter and um, Indigenous Lives Matter and all of the um, uh, all of the conversations that are happening so urgently right now around race and police and all the you know all of that. One of the the uh, phrases that I keep hearing is about um, about being be, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, and I think I think those those grief therapists uh, you know who are listening well uh, they're probably like yeah we've been uncomfortable with the uncomfortable you know uncomfortable with the uncomfortable for a long time because that's that's a lot of what what we need to be able to do with grief is acknowledge it, sit with it, first of all, acknowledge it in ourselves so that we can acknowledge it in others and be comfortable with the uncomfortable. And that's the other part of like the silence is sometimes we need to just be silent. Yeah, exactly. That's thank you so much for bringing that up because it was a conversation we were actually having at the CSW as well was how would our lives and and our societies be changed if we weren't so afraid of pain, like if we weren't so afraid of sitting with the uncomfortable conversations and the difficult topics, grief being one of them, there are many difficult, many challenging topics. But how would how would our lives and our families' lives and our communities' lives and our clients' lives if we weren't so afraid of pain? Yeah. 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 Yes. So it's the, it's a similar thing. Um, I also wanted to say to everyone on here who is sharing their stories of even their own grief, thank you so so much. We will at at some point when we go offline, we compile all the comments and questions and. Um, We do review them, so if I haven't got to them yet, uh, thank you so, so, so much for sharing and for engaging. Uh, I want to do maybe one more question, because we are kind of getting towards the end of our our time. Um, I feel like we could go on for (laughs) a long time, (laughs) considering how many how many amazing comments and questions we have here. Um, can you speak a little bit more, just a little bit maybe for those people who came a bit late about the no more five stages? Sure. Um, so, you know, it was the, the, the five stages were never ever intended, to, originally not intended to be about grief. And, and I think I think in some ways it's part of our um, our desire. The fact that they kind of got into um, into the social fabric is part of our desire to kind of uh, to to uh, make something really difficult easier. Um, and so that you know this notion that there's there's only five things that you do and you kind of move through it and. That there, there's you know a little bit of a map um, that uh, you know it got taken up that way because it kind of makes it seem easy, um, and it's it's not easy, and it you know it is not it is it is not easy to breathe, um, and um, it it's it's a, it's a false notion that you know that there's these signs that you follow along and that. Um, life returns to normal and uh, you know people people who are grieving often talk about the new normal um and um you know life does move on um but um the five stages just it, it oversimplifies things and that's you know that's why my personal favorite is that oscillation model because it recognizes that as humans we're not we're not always looking in the same direction and mm-hmm. you know and we like to, um, in social work, kind of, um, in, you know, uh, we don't like the, this notion that people are in denial, but denial is really healthy. Um, mm-hmm. and we might need to manage it, but we can't live all of the time with, you know, certain realities like pandemics 
you know, in our in our faces all the time. We have to manage that and compartmentalize that. And that's what denial is in a manageable form. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think um, that's part of um, that, that, that grieving is that we, um, we need to recognize how complex it all is, how hard it all is, and that there's, that there's nothing simple or staged or linear about it. Um, so the five stages, you know, it, you, you can describe it however you want, and it might not have been the original t intention of it, but that's the way it's been taken up, and it's just become more of a disservice than a service. And when you when you get people showing up in therapist's office saying, I'm not grieving correctly because I haven't done stage, you know you have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I just I wanted to come back to that because a lot of the questions have been around COVID and are you know, are we doing this right? And I just I wanted to go back to this idea that there isn't necessarily a right and right. or wrong way. I've, of course, as social workers, Well, I think I think we've lost Alexandra. So <laughs> well, um I don't know if if uh, everyone can still hear, but um, I want to thank everyone for for being here and uh, um, invite feedback um, and questions. And there's lots of resources. Um, and um, yeah, I hope uh, I hope that we will hear from you soon. going on with our technical issues. I actually really appreciate that. Can you hear me? All right, well, you know what? I think we're gonna wrap up for today uh, on this note, just because of the technical stuff, you never know with people's internet. So uh, thank you so much for coming and spending what is now about an hour and seven minutes with us. We always appreciate it. This in terms of uh, content and in terms of feedback from all of you and all the participants. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, in terms of feedback, I am. I feel Truly, my heart feels warm hearing all of your comments, your experiences with grief, your experiences with grief right now, your experiences with grief with your clients and your communities. I hope that we continue to have this conversation. Likely, this will go up on our YouTube. If you haven't found it yet, we have a Facebook peer-to-peer -peer support group that is on Facebook um, on our webpage at the Canadian Association of Social Workers. So you're always more than welcome to go to that peer-to-peer -peer support group and continue this discussion. We did post the webinar there so please feel free to go on and have some engaging comments there if you want to talk about how that webinar was thank you again so much i feel good i feel like this was a this was an important topic and i appreciate you hanging out with us even through our technical difficulties uh, we will see you soon get out and enjoy your day and thank you again bye